I'm Helen Hansen, your host, and today we have another wonderful webinar planned for you on a holistic health topic. And chatting with us today, we have Dr. Arin Fundamaba, who is a holistic health medical doctor. Welcome, Arin. And then we also have Dr. Kevin Lenton. He's a chiropractor and he's also a functional wellness specialist. Hi, Kevin. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. And Dr. Saloshni Reddy, who is an Ayurveda wellness practitioner. So good to have you with us, Saloshni. Thank you, Helen, for having me on this incredible show. And behind the scenes, we have lovely Anne Merritt. So Anne is making sure that our recording actually happens. She is a marketing specialist, specifically online. But Anne is also the founder and has a very big project under her wing called Women Connect. So do go have a look at this group. And if you're able to, to join, and receive all the, the wonderful inspirations that she is working with, with a whole host of a variety of women um, across the board, nationally and internationally. Please do yourself a favor and join her and the rest of us there as well. We also are saying a big thank you today to Odyssey Magazine. So Odyssey has helped us to spread the word about this particular webinar, and they're also going to be giving away two subscriptions. We've got some other prizes as well. Thank you, Arin, for your 12-week online optimal health and wellness course. And then we've got buckflower remedies that we're going to be giving away, um, some colloidal silver as well, and a few other goodies that we'll tell you about at the, at the end. And if you're wanting to win one of those prizes, you just need to answer a question, and that question will be posed towards the end of the webinar. So do settle down into a, a comfortable chair, and grab a cup of tea or some water, and get ready to join us as we dive inside insomnia. So we all know that sleep is the best medicine and sleep can help the body to detox. Uh, it restores balanced emotions. And when we sleep on something, we often wake up the next morning and suddenly we have a clearer mind and are able to have the aha that we were looking for the day before. But, when sleep eludes one, the whole system can go haywire. And someone who has experience of just that is Mani Krovia. So we know Mani as a musician, a songwriter, um, a composer. She's been a household name in South Africa since the 1980s. But she's here today to share her story with us of her struggle with sleep. And I recently chatted with Manny on the phone about this and this is what she had to say. So I want to start back to my childhood where I was a lot lamiki and being alone uh, a lot of the time. I uh, loved going to school, loved going to play with friends. But night times were scary for me because the grown-ups would be on the farm, the grown-ups would be in the lounge, and I'd be in my in my room uh, way at the back of the house. And, um, yeah, so a silly little story about my mum would tell me to go and fetch a jersey in my room and... I would switch on lights from the lounge down the long passage to my room, uh, fetch my jersey, and then the nightmare started for me. <laughs> um, running back, switching lights off, and I felt like the dark was going to bite my butt any minute. Um, so that would cause me, um, I would say, restless sleep. It started with restless sleep, and I was quite scared. And then my mom had to leave the farm for about six months and I stayed behind with my lovely sister-in-law who was much older than me, um, who cared for me very beautifully, put me to bed every night um, with the blankets over my ears. I still sleep like that. <laughs> um, but I would wake up in the night and um, want to climb into bed with her and my brother. Um, so... I think it started with being scared 
I don't know if it was nightmares, but certainly scared for the dark and lying and listening and every little creak um, uh, was a thing for me. And I think <clears throat> because I grew up alone and my imagination was quite uh, vivid <laughs> and alive, um, yeah, there would be imaginary things happening. I think all little children have that. When I started being a single mother and living on my own, I always say I sleep with my ears outside the house. I can hear the leaves change color. And yeah, so you sleep in, a, in an awake state and an, in an alert state where your sleep is not solid. Eventually, um, yeah, it's, of course, then you go into menopause or your perimenopause. And I started experiencing night sweats and started waking up 2 o'clock, then again 3 o'clock, then again 4 o'clock, then again 5 o'clock, and not necessarily because of night sweats. It's just how it works. I have to say, in those days, I went to bed quite late. So then, closer to now, I am very good at wanting to sleep. So, if work allows it, by 10 o'clock, I try to put my light out. If I simply can't, uh, for whatever reason, uh, latest 11 o'clock. For me, none of that is good. 10 o'clock is good, 11 o'clock is not good. Then I start playing with my sleep. Of course, when you work 18-hour days, as it sometimes happens in my um, in my line of work, then you go to bed incredibly tired. You literally melt into your mattress, only to wake up two hours later. Oh, my goodness, anxiety attack. I forgot to phone such and such or sent this and this. And, um, yeah, being a control freak, I'm a little bit OCD, um, and I have attention deficit disorder. And for those who don't know what that is, um, better go check it up. It doesn't mean that I don't know how to concentrate. Um, I think when, when, when sickles with monofocus a lot of the time, that I'm so... Um, deadbeat on getting a job done that um, I totally forget the time. That definitely happened when I started becoming computer literate. Um, one, uh, one time in the very beginning, I was so excited about being able to do something. I carried on and I carried on and I couldn't understand why my dogs were so restless. And um, I would take them outside. Oops, it's already dark. But I carry on and I carry on. And they stay restless and they keep pumping at me. And um, and eventually I got so fed up with this. I thought, oh, okay. And I got up. And then I checked the clock and it was 5.30 the next morning. And, um, you know, so little moments like that um, happen. And um, you just have to manage it. Uh, whichever way you can, to be mindful, to set a clock. <clears throat> I've done things like put a huge red alarm clock next to my desk to remind me um, uh, about the time, and I ignore it because I'm so in 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 um, yeah, just so inside what I'm doing that I I ignore the clock. So I think those things are very are very important is to become hella mindful about how you spend the time before you go to bed. Um, if you're catching a movie, try and watch it at a time or, or, or check what the, the length of the movie is so that you don't eat into your going to bed time. And, um, and if it does, I sure think you have to do something to to restore the lost time. For me, it's imperative that one plans your sleeping like you plan your day. 
um, this is the body that you come in, that you live in. Um, if you don't take care of it, where will you live? Is a silly thing to say, but it's a very true thing to say. So your body needs to recuperate and to sleep and to rest from all the things that happen during the day. Um, dysfunctional people, lovely people, drama at work, beautiful moments with your cat or your dog. Um, all sorts of things impact on your awareness. But most importantly, that as you plan your day, you should plan your sleep. Um, I don't have a routine routine, but I kind of feel um, it's important to to have uh, what I call my sleep buddies around. And number one is to watch the clock towards 10 o'clock at night um, because your best sleep is before 12, right? And then whatever comes during the night, if you wake up again at 2 or 3 or 4, as one does when one gets older, um, that at least you had your best sleep in before 12. So my my ritual is, um, and suggested ritual is, to have a lovely warm shower or a bath, to drink some chamomile tea if you can, I can't. Yeah, and to just switch off the TV, just listen to the quiet night. Um, I'm lucky I live close to the sea, so I can, if it's high, uh, high tide, I can hear the waves breaking, and that's my best sleep. If I go to sleep with the sea in my ears, that's literally my lullaby. I can't do without slow, slow release magnesium, which speaks to my... Um, my naughty child. My naughty child is my brain. Um, it never stops. I have um, a nervous system inside my brain that is really like somebody changing channels every five seconds. Um, unless there's something I'm literally thinking about. But if I leave it alone, <clears throat> it has the remote to change, to change the channels all the time. And, yeah, there's a highway of visions and ideas and conversations and memories <clears throat> that flood back. Yeah, and then so my body is saying, please, can I go to sleep now? And my brain says, no, look, there's more stuff to look at. And, um, yeah, that's what happens. I also suffer from nocturia, so some nights better than others. So if I have a nocturia night, I literally get up somewhere between five and six times a night to have a wee-wee because I'm so scared to wet my bed. <laughs> that is a thing also left over from childhood. <clears throat> Um, and please note that I live alone and any and all of these um, does not involve a life partner. I've been alone for so long. Uh, I wouldn't know what to do if I had a life partner. Perhaps I'd sleep better. I don't know. But yeah. Um, so uh, just also to say, I think that any and all of my issues uh, – have to do with uh, my hormones are out of balance. I don't know how to balance them. I'm too, I've gone to endocrinologists. They just care to faff around. Because when I was going into menopause, I refused hormone therapy to scare of breast cancer. Um, and I also, all the bad times in my life, I went without medication. I am that bison, that American bison that faces into the storm, alive and alert. And I live through every moment. I'm an empath. I wake up with dire thoughts of people and animals in need. Um, yeah, so there's a lot that can keep me awake. Thank you so much, Mani, for sharing 
your story with us. And I'm sure if you are struggling with sleep and you're watching this webinar now, there's something in that story that might have resonated with you because there were just so many examples of different triggers there but, uh, from childhood to anxiety, um, the fact that she wakes up or, or can't go to sleep with the, the, the naughty child, her, her busy mind, uh, as she calls it. And then, of course, the the body clock coming into place with the, the hormones going all out of sync. So I'd like to turn to our specialists now. Um, Kevin, let's start with you, if you don't mind. From a functional wellness perspective, how would you look at a case such as Manny's? Oh my gosh, um, this could take a long time. But just to uh, summarize it all, insomnia is essentially a symptom. So we don't need to treat the insomnia by suppressing the symptom and forcing the body to go to sleep with the likes of sleeping pills. Um, whenever you have a symptom, there's always a cause somewhere lurking, sometimes quite deep down. From a functional perspective, I look at three particular areas because it's a, a dysregulation or a, some kind of a variation in the body's ability to manage its own biochemistry. So our bodies are big chemistry sets. Nothing happens haphazardly. It's all driven and caused by the production of hormones and enzymes and neurotransmitters and chemical substances that make all of our systems, including our sleep system, function optimally. So the key is to start looking upstream. Uh, and when I say that, I'm referring to looking further back to where the causes of any of these particular triggers might be. So there are three main areas that I would focus on. One is the structural area, and that's the structure of your body, which is your musculoskeletal system. I'm actually a chiropractor as well. And so uh, I'm very tuned into body uh, issues around musculoskeletal system uh, factors. And so anyone that has tension or pain or discomfort or stiffness will have difficulty sleeping because they won't be able to get comfortable. So we look at the structural system from a musculoskeletal point of view, but taking it much deeper and looking more upstream at the cellular structure of the body, because all of this chemistry that's going on, this symphony of music that your hormones and enzymes and glands and organs are playing uh, is driven by this chemical messenger substance. So we have to look at the communication pathways that are influencing whether your body can actually uh, produce a beautiful symphony or whether it's going to be a very bangy, noisy, kind of dysregulated sound, which is going to be symptoms. So we look at structure of the physical body and the cellular body. We'll look more intensely at the biochemistry and the bionutrition of the body, looking at all the different systems. So the hormonal system, the digestive system, the respiratory system, even the spiritual system, the elimination and detoxification systems, any one of these could be causing some kind of a state of dysregulation. And finally, of course, the uh, final part of the triangle, this triad, as I call it, the triad of health, is the psycho-emotional system. And each and every one of those could be contributing, and usually they are. It's never just one thing. And as we've heard in Mani's story, there were many different factors that could be uh, contributory. And at some point, one area may be more contributory than another. Uh, and with many of these things, it's a, it's a management thing. It's not a treatment. You don't just come in, have one consultation with someone and says, just do this, do that, and do the other thing. And suddenly everything kind of sorts itself out. As in Mani's case, you heard from when she was a child already, there were uh, dysregulations in the chemistry from a fear perspective, a worry, anxiety perspective. And those, um, those conditions become hardwired into our cellular system. Uh, it's definitely not just a switch that you turn off and everything's fine. Uh, it's often a, you have to be a detective to go back, further back, back, back uh, in what we call your timeline to try and figure out what's going on and, and where the big triggers are. Thanks, Kevin. Yes, so one needs a, a holistic perspective, what I'm hearing there, to, to look at the whole puzzle to help put those 
pieces to together um, to provide a, a place of, of wellness in, in our home, as Mani so beautifully termed the body. Yes. So, Lashni, now turning to you, I'm, I'm very interested to know, just from hearing Mani's story now, would you be able to determine what dosha she is? Um, yes, she's actually a combination of Vata and Peter. Helen. So Mani's personal, uh, personal experiences with chronic insomnia is um, quite unique. And you can see it's, it's, it's chronic in the sense that she's had this from childhood um, through her current stage. And she's had it through menopause as well. So it's, it's various cycles of her life that she's, she's const constantly had this. And, in, in, and when, as I mentioned, uh, from an Ayurvedic perspective and her dosha type, is a combination of, an, of a vata and a pitta. So how we actually look at the vata and the pitta is there's, it's built on elements of, the, uh, of nature. So space in the sense that there's potential, air, which is, which is change, and there's fire, which is transformation. So we can look at that in terms of our digestion. And there's water, which is cohesiveness, and earth. So in terms of where Mani is, uh, as I said, she's the, 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 a combination of the Vata and the Pitta. So she has in her mind-body constitution. So if you have to look at what's as above as below scenario, uh, she has a combination of uh, a dominance of space, air, and fire. And when you go into this and you dive deeper into it, um, the into specifically the Vata element, uh, the characteristics of Vata or the space in the air um, is cold, light, dry, regular, rough, mobile, quick and changeable. As you can see in her, in her uh, case, uh, she says she's uh, constantly, uh, her mind is constantly changing like uh, as if it's a remote control. So you can see that it's, irregular, it's rough, it's mobile, it's always constantly changing. So you can see her mind is actually very Vata. And uh, going into her career perspective, she is a creative as well. So creative is a person that's constantly looking at different ideas and thoughts. So her mind is overworked. And if you go into her constitution uh, uh, resembling the wind, um, so her characteristics um, of a person with water qualities is a person that ha is, is a thin light frame um, and this obviously is changeable over seasons as well of, of your life. Um, the variables in digestions and sleep patterns, there's dry skin and hair, uh, cold hands and feet, she, there's movements that are, that are quick and uh, in terms of physical movements as well as talking as well because the mind and the body is trying to correlate. So if you have to think of the wind as well, it's also going on the same, same perspective. Um, you can see she says she has somewhat of a routine because you resist routine as a Vata person. You like it, but you also resist it because you're, because you're changeable. Uh, you know when you're in balance, she, as she uh, subtly mentioned, there is a routine, but there isn't a routine. Um, so that particular uh, you, you can quickly pick up that it's a vata uh, dosha type and she obviously welcomes new experiences so she likes the constant change um, in terms of the when, when a person is in balance a vata person is in balance they have energy so they're very energetic uh, they're extremely creative they're extremely adaptable they show in a lot of initiative they, they a good communicator, and they have a lot of spontaneity. They're quite spontaneous. Um, when they're out of balance, um, they, they, the mind is overactive. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of worry. There's inconsistency. And insomnia kicks in. And from a physical component in your body, there's constipation, and there's gas, and there's bloating. And I think this is where Kevin went in further and he says this is where he goes in and dives in deeper in terms of the physical um, to see what those symptoms uh, are. But this is just an overview of what a constitution is from a Vata perspective. 
And as I mentioned, she's also uh, a pitta. So the pitta, the primary function of a pitta is transformation and metabolism. So uh, she's quick thinking. She's also um, transforming and moving. And um, her other dominant uh, uh, mind-body constitution is a pitta element, which is uh, broken down into fire and water. And the qualities of this is this hot, this lightness, this this penetration, this pungent, sharp, acidic, and she's moist. So uh, in terms of, I would say in, she's predominantly her a main uh, dosha type is Vata, but she does have a personality contribution of fire, the fiery nature that's in her. Um, and uh, these are the characteristics of being a medium built person, strong digestion, warm body temperatures, sleep soundly for short periods, um, I think she mentioned at one time she used to have um, power naps for 10 minutes at a time and over the period that has come, you know, has uh, actually slipped away from her. She has sharp intellect, there's direct, she's direct and she's precise and she stays close to routine. But I think over time that also, so, they, so as I mentioned, she's predominantly a water imbalance and this courageousness. Um, and you can see that in her personality as well um, with the changes that she's had in her life. So when a person uh, is in balance in, in a Peter state, they are bright, they are warm, they are friendly, they are good decision-making, they are leader, they are strong digestion. When they are out of balance, they become a bit uh, angry, irritable, excessively critical, judgmental, aggressive, their skin rashes, et cetera. So, um, as I mentioned, we're specifically speaking about um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the scenario of um, of of mining at the moment. So, going back to your, um, the Vata and Pitta combination are more prone to having insomnia. And later on, from an Ayurvedic perspective, I will share with you a sleep routine to counter to counterbalance the insomnia episodes that one experiences. I find the, the doshas fascinating. Um, I know that there is uh, one more. That's kapha. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Sorry, I was just running out of time. But yes, the, so I didn't really go too much into the kapha element. Uh, and um, if you can just allow me just quickly. So kapha is your earth element. And that's made out of the earth and water. Um, and kapha doesn't quite actually have... Um, in, in, challenges with sleeping, they're very steady, they, they have their routine, uh, the characteristics of a kapha person, um, they're slow moving, they have easygoing personalities, so they're not really phased uh, and um, off the currents that's happening on the top, they're very grounded in that sense there. Um, but when they are out of balance, they are um, dull, the inert, they needy, they can get attached. Uh, they have more physical um, imbalances in the sense there's congestion, there's overweight, there's complacency. Um, obviously, with their mind being a little bit more stagnant, they are this because we're all psychosomatic beings, so it uh, directly affects the body as well. Uh, when they are in balance, uh, they're steady, they're consistent, they're loyal, they're strong. So those are the the characteristics and please there is no right and there's no wrong and and we all have this throughout our our life throughout our days you know that so i mean there's just so much we can expand on on the different dosha types and personally in our day-to-day -day, um interactions we have that uh mm -hmm. where we are predominantly kapha we are predominantly vata where there's lots of things happening we are a lot more active in the day. That's your pizza time. So, you know, from all of the, the modalities that I, that I, I practice, um, I read it for me is, is something that really you can dig deep into your characteristics and it's so expanded um, that you can... It helps you, you know, to understand yourself, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the most, and that's, that's what Ayurveda is. It's mm. the science of life and it's your own mm. science. So what is relevant to you is not relevant to the others. So 
and and it's constantly changing and i always say as above so below so you know as the seasons are changing you are also changing and um, often we don't want to actually acknowledge that we are changing and that's that resistance to that change um yeah so it's it's quite a holistic so holistic much. approach Yes, yes, very um, comprehensive. And I know you just only touched on the, the tip now. So if anybody would like to find out their dosha, well, of course, you can contact Saloshini directly, but she's also very kindly provided a questionnaire, which we are going to be uploading in our seven day longevity challenge, which is on our Facebook group. So you just need to go on to facebook.com forward slash uh, groups slash longevity challenge and then one of the challenges um, in October 2020 she will be placing her dosha questionnaire so go take it and, and find out um, what is your dosha type so thank you for that let's just um, go a little bit um, more deeper into looking at sleep now because that of course is why we're all here um, and finding out what does the brain need what happens in the brain for a good night's sleep irene i think we need to turn to you here as our holistic medical doctor on board today hello um yeah and i'll do the the presentation because that will as i normally do integrate the picture and i think it will also incorporate some of what um, our other uh, contributors have already said so I just want to go to the uh, screen presentation. Thank um, you. And then we'll check that. So let's start with um, just lo looking at insomnia, which is an unbelievably common problem in our lives today. And that's probably one of the problems or health challenges that I would see often in my practice and even when I do group sessions, even in workplace and that sort of thing. So with, I want to start with showing the image that you would see there. And our biggest challenge is are inclined towards anxiety and hyperactivity, like with Vata and actually mostly Pitta Doshas, as, as um, Solushni said. Um, it is a challenge. We have to actually go deeper than our personality, our inclination, not to like certain things like ritual or routine, because they, they just are certain things that we have to do if we, if we want to calm down to actually go to sleep. Because if you look at this MR scan, you would see that the left side the picture, it's like a little bit unbalanced, the brainwave patterns, if you look at the colors, so it's prone, people who are prone to anxiety and depression and overthinking. So mentally you're thinking too much with left brain. I'll talk about that just to, to simplify it a bit. So our mental and emotional health tends to go down if we're in that pattern most of the day. So what we can do to calm down, I will, I'll talk more about that, is of course meditation. Or just simple breathing if you're not used to meditation and you um, you know you have to practice that is that if you do that you can see what happens in the middle of the the image you, the middle image you can see that it's starting to harmonize and balance and then after 25 minutes if your brain can look like that you are coherent you're calm you're functioning and you've got really big uh, mental and emotional health. So we have to do that. It's just a part of us we have to get and elicit the brainwave patterns to help us um, actually cope with our own monkey chatter mind, as I call it, because that's the most important thing is that we have to calm the mind so that we can go into that deeper relaxation mode in order to fall asleep. So use this as a simplified triangle. So we will have physical, we will look at our breathing, relaxation, healthy eating, very important for insomnia, um, enough water, sleeping, of course, then for health, resting in between, and then moderate exercise and, and being out in nature. 
So I'm sketching that picture as an overview of getting our whole body into balance, our body and our mind. So side two would then be mental, emotional and psycho-spiritual is how are we thinking, how are we feeling and what can we do to uplift our feelings or our emotions so that we can have a deeper feeling of peace and calmness and then finding that connection to our deeper self which is more than our personality. So we've got to go there to transcend or even extend ourselves into think, knowing that we're more than just our personality. So we can do many things to reach that deeper part and from there we will restore our um, sleeping pattern as well. And then the, the third um, angle is or side is the social one where we with other people from family to friends to our close um, close-knit family at home, our work and our environment. So again, as, as Kevin also said, we cannot, you cannot just go in and treat, you've got to look at the bigger picture, the whole person within the, the system that they are working in. So the purpose for the sides to be in balance is to remain relaxed and calm and centered. And very important for insomnia, you've got to get into that mode before we even try to fall asleep. So if we look at our circadian rhythm, it's just to explain, I'm doing it in a very short time, but during the day, we've got our um, different times and awakeness and alertness. So we would wake up and then go through the day and our quarters are levels are actually the ones that would rise just before we wake up and make us alert so that we get up. That's the, the red line and that goes on during the day. So when you go to bed, so actually from six o'clock in the afternoon, it would start lowering the cortisol and then go down and then the next morning it would rise again. And then the melatonin is quite the inverse of that. So our melatonin will be sort of cruising along during the day but then as night approaches, after you can see there, it reaches its peak um, quite late at night. So we first start winding down and that's when we go into alpha rhythm. I'll show you just now. Then we get to physical repair, the period, the deep sleep period. And that's where melatonin actually does, it work, does its work to help us recover physically, but, but also psychologically and spiritually so that we all rested and relaxed and recovered before the cortisol levels start rising. So that's something we can measure is the cortisol levels and um, early morning to see if people are resting properly. Because sometimes people don't realize they're not sleeping well and deeply and then we can actually assess that to look at their sleeping pattern because that's something we again look at it holistically from the whole mind um, body perspective. So if we look at our, our brain cycles that anyone can have done on an EEG, we will have our beta waves, they're fast and sharp, and that's normally, you know, our normal waking consciousness. Then we would, and it's all of us go through this when we, when we go to bed, so it's a normal progress of the different brain waves that we can all learn to actually um, manage to a certain extent. Then we will drop into a sleepier state of alpha waves, and you can see they're much lower frequency. And that also happens when we daydream and light and go into light states of meditation. So this is what we actually try and aim for when we do sleep restoration, is to get people to deliberately go into alpha rhythm, because then they can go into theta waves, that's our dreaming state, also deep meditation and deep sleep, and then into delta waves, which is really when we all are um, unconscious, and then we also have rapid eye movement, which is actually a bit of a paradox, because it looks as though the eyes are moving, but we're actually in very deep sleep. So of course, from alpha to theta to delta is our aim to sleep properly. Now, if we are in beta wave when we go to sleep, then, Gradually, in people who are inclined to sleep easily, you will go 
automatically into those cycles. Very important to understand that we go through these cycles five to six times a night. So you will go from beta, alpha, theta, delta, come up again. And if you go too high into beta, which we call high beta, that's where you often then would wake up and you're hyper alert. So what we try and do is to recover that rhythm and not one single prescription drug can do that. What it does, you take a prescription um, sleeping tablet and you will go from beta to alpha in, in a quite fast um, way. And then you, I call it, you zonk out and then you wake up. So you just sleep deeply, but then you wake up and you feel all groggy because you haven't followed the natural circadian sleeping rhythms that we, well, that we actually have to do. So botanicals, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, has got a different way of acting. It would get you into the alpha waves, which is what we all actually want to do, and it's what we can be alert and awake, but we relax when, when we're even at work. But that will take you to alpha, the botanicals or herbal remedies, and then to theta and delta, and then you will follow your natural sleeping rhythm. So you can even take some of the botanicals in the middle of the night if you wake up. Because it's important to go as close to natural as possible. So if we can follow our natural sleeping cycles, it would really benefit us. Because high beta, people who are constantly in high beta during the day and the night must know that that is one of the waves that can be identified in people to tell them they actually have, um, you know, a high propensity for all the different illnesses. It does happen when for women when we get into more menopausal um, state and then we would have things like high blood pressure or weight control. Even putting on weight, fat weight specifically, is very much linked to the cortisol levels that do not drop properly if we don't sleep deeply. So anxiety, depression, heart disease in general, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, all of those and many more. Actually, all our chronic diseases or health challenges, we have to look at those brainwave patterns to help people recover deeply to go into the deep state deeper state of alpha just so that they can then um, understand the process of why they have to start managing the specific personality to understand they can go deeper they not um, only you know their personalities so if we just quickly look at herbal help i'm just mentioning a few we're not going there's no time to go into detail but Valeriana officinalis, or just Valerian is a common name. It's got no side effects. It doesn't cause any form of dependency, um, you know, if contrary than to sleeping pills that so often have dependency and side effects and challenges. Then we get hops or humulus lupulus um, that's commonly used in beer manufacturing. But if you often you would get Valerian root and the hops together in a, in a combination for relaxation and sleep support. Then very important before bedtime, I would, I'm going to um, just sort of mention it um, just now to have a bit of a sleep ritual or a sleep routine. So it's really good to have some tea before bedtime where you can order tincture or capsules. And the calming combo that I often prescribe to people that's easily available in a combo or, or then if people want to buy the separate teas and then make their own. Um, so lavender, lemon balm, chamomile, rose and rose geranium, passion flower, that's grenadella, then orange blossom and bitter orange, very, very effective. And then most important, or not most, but very important, is cocoa, raw cocoa, I have to say. And people can mix that into hot, you know, boiling water like you would make um, tea or coffee. Or, of course, warm milk, which is a really good um, calming down thing to have milk, but not, some people can't have the milk. And then I also referred to this in the, the challenge that, uh, that all participants go, goes through before the and if you've missed it, 
please go back and look at that. I won't repeat it now. But the cocoa is important. It's also part um, that binds to our endocannabinoid uh, system, the receptors that are read there, but actually um, CBD oil, cannabis, or the cannabidiol, it's not the psychoactive THC, but the CBD, or what I would call even the medicinal cannabis, works very well also then to help people sleep. Even though it's the terpenes and it's very active as an antioxidant and an immune support, it also helps the nervous system to relax and calm down. Now, that's where cocoa would also come in to help the nervous system calm down because it binds also to those same endocannabinoid um, receptors. Then you can have a relaxing oil mix that you can put in a burner or some drops in your bath. And I definitely recommend a bath where you can relax and wind down with some Epsom salts and then your, your relaxing oils. The same as we would find in the herbs that I've mentioned in the, uh, under teas. You can also put that in a burner next to your bath or some drops in the bath with the Epsom salts just to lie back and relax. A shower is great for cleaning and energizing you in the morning, but in the evening, for especially if you struggle with insomnia, it's really a good idea to lie down. And then, of course, there are many homeopathic sleep drops and tablets, which you can also find um, online or at the pharmacy or um, health shops. Then I'm just going to quickly run through this. One of the things that's really good to have for, you know, just for sleep and also for people with sleep apnea would be bananas. So it's nice to have a banana or a banana smoothie where you also add the, the nuts because that helps to get your melatonin going and to lower the cortisol. So bananas are really good people. We take that, it increases our 5 hydroxytryptophan which is the precursor of serotonin. So that's really a good sort of helper for um, sleeping. Then we could have some starches and again carbohydrates, which is like a, a low glycemic index people can have for dinner, like rice, potato, pasta, or whole wheat pasta, or different types of rice. And then the legumes, all our beans, very good for calming down and giving us really good quality protein. The nuts I've mentioned. And remember that walnuts and pecan nuts have got the shape of the brain. So that already tells you it's good for the central nervous system, but also for the whole nervous system. And then, um, and, and I have to say that, making love, not having sex, I call it making love for the whole thing around intimacy. It's actually a really good sleep inducer. For those of us who struggle with headaches, when we know that's another function coming up or something to do, this is just the, to look at that because it increases our serotonin, dopamine, and actually oxytocin. So it's a really good feel, good calming, bonding kind of activity. And then to find those feelings of peace and joy before you actually even try to go to bed, which is part of your sleep routine. Okay, so then just for restorative sleep, as I said with melatonin, um, that's the restore the restoration hormone or um, or peptide. First of all, to learn to breathe, and I call it the three Bs, the, the belly breathing break. So you literally, and that's also on the longevity channel where I explained the whole um, breathing routine where you push out the tummy as you breathe in and you hold it a bit and you breathe out completely. That's to calm your sympathetic nervous system, the, the high activity one, and to actually encourage your parasympathetic calming nervous system to come into play so that you can move from the beta to the alpha rhythm at least. Then quiet. No music, no TVs or anything in your bedroom, especially to calm down, to get yourself out of that. I'm talking about TV, not to watch even early evening, um, to watch any action, any bad news. Like the news in general is not to watch the evening news because you can't sleep if you're all stressed up and worried and things. So good news is hardly ever news, so it's not good to watch that. 
and not have your computer or cell phone in the bedroom. Darkness, so as dark as possible, especially people who do shift work. If they have to sleep during the day, make sure the drapes are, you know, to sort of um, block most of the sun, sunlight coming in, so that uh, cortisol goes down when it's dark, melatonin goes up when it's dark, so that's very important. The mattress must be firm and comfortable. Also, the room temperature, not too, hot, not too hot and especially not too cold, so around 22 degrees. Look at your colors. Don't try and sleep in a bed with fire colors. That's more for where you want to be alert and awake. So there you can look at the pastel soft, softer colors like greens and light, light blues, like greens, lilac, all of that. And then your preparation, I've mentioned to have a bit of a, a preparation for your um, sleep to calm down and not to be too active. And it's good for us for general health to just sort of calm down. And then avoid stimulants. If you're tired during the day and you take that, it's going to prevent you from sleeping during the night. And also alcohol. Alcohol People who use it and use one glass of wine, for instance, it is calming and it will probably help you relax and sleep. But if you have too much alcohol, it can induce sleep onset, but it disrupts the sleep and also leads to depression, a feeling of you know, low energy or depression the next day. Important, don't go to bed hungry, but don't eat a heavy meal three hours before you sleep. The same with exercise. Wonderful to exercise, but for three hours before, don't do strenuous exercise. You can do stretches like yoga and relaxation. Anything where you can stretch your body a bit. It's good before you um, go to bed, but not heavy exercise three hours before, at least three hours before bedtime. So what I want to say then is don't try so hard to sleep because there's a huge resistance because people start thinking oh i hope i'm going to sleep tonight what's going to happen i'm so tired i that primes you right into beta or high beta brain waves so we've got to get to a point where we say i accept and allow whatever my night brings so you can even use a distraction like reading something inspirational not something too active doodle or write or scribble it just takes your mind off and puts you back into alpha mode, relaxing, and you will feel you sleep, feeling sleepy and tired and then fall asleep. Then meditate, the, the relaxation, very important, and breathing. And then, of course, getting out in nature. Even now, it's summer, you can go out, outside even when it's at night. And then some gentle stretches, just next to your bed. You can just lift your arms, really twist your body a little bit, stretch, and then try to sleep um, again. And then in conclusion, very important, slow down all your busy activities after sunset. It's in any case good for your health. Spend less time doing and more time quieting yourself, simply being. And candlelight, very good to fall asleep and get you into that mode. Also in your bathroom, when you take your bath, switch off the lights, the artificial lights, and put on some candles it really calms us into alpha mode and don't work until bedtime because that keeps your brain too active and then you can't fall asleep because the mind goes on and on so slow down a little bit and remember that the night holds many wonders it's a time of quiet and solitude rest and rejuvenation so look forward to it it's not something negative and if you program yourself not to sleep that is most probably um, what, what would happen. So go outside, even lie on the grass, grass and look at the stars and just be grateful. And it's amazing how quickly your brain will move from beta or even high beta into alpha and then you will actually fall asleep a lot, a lot better. Thank you. That's all from my side. And then I've got my book, Stress Solutions, and also the Stress Solutions um, USB with the relaxation tracks, which is another way when you 
if you learn to meditate and you find you can't, your mind wanders, is to listen to a short breathing exercise or a visualization um, and then you will fall asleep a lot easier because that's calming, calming that left brain so that the right brain can come into play, the alpha, theta, delta, and your whole brain then can work uh, prob properly together as a whole brain and not half a brain. Because that's our biggest problem is our left brain that's too active and too busy and to calm down the thoughts. Any, any person can learn how to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Irene, for sharing that uh, valuable and very easy to understand information of the, the different brainwave patterns. Um, and I noticed in one of your um, latest slides, I think it was the second last one, where you were mentioning um, changing one's light at night before going to sleep and the effects on the brain. And I recently read an article where they mentioned the time where before we had the electric light bulb, people were sleeping approximately 10 hours a night. So just a very beautiful direct um, observation of how light is such a big impact on our sleep. If you're wanting to make use of any of Dr. Irene's um, tinctures or supplements, remedies that she mentioned, um, she's got a whole host which can assist you in your holistic health, which of course, as she explained, you know, is going to help not only your body during the day, but at night as well. Please uh, go along to her website and you are going to be receiving a code. She's very graciously offered um, TLC viewers a discount. And if you use that code, then you will be getting a discount off her products. Um, and that code is going to be shared in the next newsletter. Um, if you haven't joined our newsletter, then please do so. You can do so at the longevityco.coza. You'll see a link there. Otherwise, uh, maybe a little bit easier, you can go along to Longevity Store, longevitystore.coza, where Dr. Arian's products are as well. And you can also purchase directly from there. So thank you for that, Arian, and all your, your wonderful time and sharing that you've done today and previously. But now I'm wanting to find out from Kevin, in your practice as a chiropractor, and then also from, of course, as a life coach, because it's, you know, we, we have holistic beings as you, you were describing so beautifully earlier with that triad. What have you found are the most common triggers for insomnia? Oh, thanks, and thanks uh, to the other contributors. I mean, what an amazing overview of this whole, what actually can be quite a complex topic, um, but so beautifully put together in very logical and simplistic terms. So well done, everybody. Um, what I've found to be perhaps the most important thing is to realize that not everybody needs all of those interventions. Because uh, sometimes it can be something very simple, a single thing. And uh, the last thing we want to do is bombard anybody with many different things that they've got to do and take a kind of a, a spray and pray approach. You know, you just hit them with anything and hope that something's going to land. And this is the, uh, the whole crux and um, critical aspect of functional wellness is drilling down deeper and deeper into getting to as close to you as one can to the cause. And it could be something just very simple, like introducing meditation, for example. Uh, and so one of the most prevalent factors is biochemical individuality. There is no one simple thing that fits for everybody. Everybody is a little bit different. However, there obviously are a number of specific um, areas that will affect most people. And when we're looking at insomnia, we have to break it down maybe into the five main areas, which have been kind of um, recommended and suggested already and that is number one is obviously the whole physical side of things and there's could be a whole bunch of things like your bed for example that's not comfortable your pillow that's not comfortable um, back pain neck pain those kind of things those are the physical components and that pretty much is affecting a lot of people these days I've seen in my practice just through this whole you know the last six months seven months where one's 
many people are experiencing greater levels of anxiety and worry and overwhelm and you know lack of hope as to what's going to happen and so that has had a knock-on effect and i've seen an increase for sure in sleep dysregulation so physical things are very important of course environmental factors will also play a part it's something simple just like a room that's too light uh, or a um, too much noise in the background which could be natural noise it could be birds or things like that but that is enough to just disrupt those patterns of course there's the whole psychological component uh, which uh, plays into I think just about everything in some way uh, and of course there are different habits some people take medications that are known to be sleep disruptors so you can do as as much as you like with meditation, breathing, uh, drinking tea, and whatever you want to. But if you're taking a medication, which might have been prescribed for something completely different, uh, a blood pressure medication is one of them, for example. Um, even diabetic medication, which is so common and prevalent, those are known to have uh, an effect on one's biochemistry, and that can be you know, sleep disruptive. So sometimes it's very good to make a very careful analysis of those, all those different habits, again, like Irene has pointed out, alcohol, for example, um, eating very late at night is another factor that could, you know, a habit that one gets into, but that can be very destructive in terms of one's ability to fall asleep because you don't want to upregulate your digestive system uh, late at night when you try to get off to sleep. And so now suddenly your whole digestive system is having to kick into action to digest um, your late night snack. Uh, and if you are sensitive to that, that could definitely be a trigger. And then as was so eloquently put, um, put across was that whole circadian rhythm process, which is very, very important. And there are many components to that. So um, it's a long way around of answering your question is what are the main things? I can't really say that there's a main thing. They all can play a role. And some people do need a combination of all of those uh, interventions. But the most important thing is to make sure that there are things that have a therapeutic effect. So not all interventions have a therapeutic effect. And that's the key to figure out what is working. So in my practice, I'd, I try and be very selective and try particular processes. Fortunately, with the benefit of experience, many years in clinical practice, uh, I can you know, figure out a lot of things, even if not clinically, just through intuition. And so you can hone in on particular areas and, you know, focus and, and try it out. Sometimes it is a bit of an experimentation process. I think everybody will agree nothing works 100% of the time for 100% of the people. So it's about finding that sweet spot. It's about finding the, the square peg that fits into a square hole, not trying to drive a round peg into a square hole. It just, it just doesn't fit. So um, the, many of those different factors that need to be... Um, Kind of introduce and they can vary you know at, at one time it can be more of a psychological component there's a stressful work environment going on or a stressful environmental environment situation in terms of a relationship and then you know six weeks eight weeks a couple, few months down the line that all settles down and then it's something different that pops up and so it's um it's a very variable thing it's a long way around to answer your question but, you know, we, we are interesting um, holistic beings, so that makes absolute sense, and which is why I've, um, I've always been interested in your approach coming not only from the physical body, but from taking everything into account, as you've just mentioned. Um, and I just want to quickly find out, uh, we were, when we were chatting recently, you mentioned that besides having your, your practice where people can come and see you, uh, which is in Weinberg, Cape Town, you also have online work that where you can coach people. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, managing life is, is, can be quite complicated at times. Um, and it's this whole management and what I'm seeing and what's been around actually for a long time, many people are not really sick, but they're just not really well. Uh, and I often describe it as your, your get up and go has got up and gone. You know, they're just not firing on all cylinders. They're just not quite there. And that's not a switch that you just turn on or off. It often requires quite a, this process of being a detective again, really trying to drill down to early things. And even in Mamie's um, talk that she 
she uh, that you played earlier you know it can go back to years and years ago and suddenly something triggers it 20 30 40 years later something that happened in your childhood so a coaching process is um it's not something we've been kind of brought up with as a natural thing we know all about sports coaches you know sportsmen have coaches even uh, elite sportsmen golfers tennis players they all have coaches that help them even though they're at the top of their game they still need to be um you know just held they need to be coaxed in a particular direction to get that really the top sweet spot and health coaching is very much like that as well sadly um we've been brought up to believe that health is the absence of disease so just because you haven't got a diagnosis at the moment it doesn't mean that you are healthy you um and you do not have to be sick to get better you can actually improve the way you uh you feel by these what what i refer to as therapeutic lifestyle interventions uh, and this coaching process is it's becoming very relevant now we live in a very complicated world as we all know we've been bombarded uh, every which way with whether it's social media whether it's the news whether it's whatever it is there's no off button these days we're working until later um it's no longer coming home at sort of 4:30 5 o'clock in the evening sitting down you know having the family all get together and having a real family time and having a big sense of community not only because of the covid situation but we we distracted disjointed and dysregulated in many ways and that's resulting in us you know with this whole thing of being depleted depressed demotivated and um just not not firing on all cylinders so yes i've developed more recently actually this whole coaching thing because it just became such a necessity i just can't see enough people on a one on one basis in the clinic so i've uh, spread it uh, in fact global now uh where we're able to with the benefit of technology talk to people all over the world and spread this word of um getting healthier because sadly the world is getting sicker even with all these very fancy medical interventions medical knowledge uh tests and mris that we can do the world's getting sicker and um, diabetes is on the increase alzheimer's is on the increase depression is on the increase all of these chronic degenerative diseases uh, and there's a reason for that and that's because we we're not doing life correctly we we're doing it all wrong actually so um, i've really just uh trying to spread this this word of health as opposed to disease and uh, i'm doing it through a, a coaching model Uh, I love that approach. Mm. So, if you are interested in what um, Kevin is talking about, uh, please stay on until the end, and we will have a slide there with all the speakers' details and the websites or Facebook groups that you can go and join. And just uh, really encourage you to do that and get all the newsletters. Uh, you know take in as much of these offerings as as you can and through repetition and re- repetition create new healthy habits because of course with something like insomnia an easy habit to fall into is taking a sleeping pill and somebody might start with oh i'm just taking it tonight oh i'm just taking it now for this week and the next thing it's a year later I just want to open up here to to everybody maybe I when we can start with you what is your take on sleeping tablets Let's just unmute yourself Um I actually did mention that the problem with sleeping tablets is that it really um doesn't help you to follow your natural cycle so the closer we can get to whatever therapeutic intervention we want to do of um practice is then to rather take do something where your brain networks can follow its normal right those waves are we going right through the whole body and the whole mind like a pebble in a that you throw into a stream it could go through but with sleeping tablets just put you completely out of it and you don't follow your cycle so you feel groggy where i would not recommend myself cuz i haven't done mainstream and um, prescription for like 25 years i always use natural remedies and they work 
extremely well. But if somebody is now really exhausted and overwhelmed, um, their GP could perhaps, or their physician, could perhaps prescribe the sleeping pill for a few days, but I wouldn't go longer than that because you're not actually restoring the natural brain cycles. So that's my take on sleeping pills. Thank you. Thank you. So Lashni, from an Ayurvedic perspective. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, from an Ayurvedic perspective, we, it, it's, it's seen as an alternative medicine. And just like how Irene believes um, natural remedies, that is my perspective and my, my take on it as well. Uh, but in cases where, and I call this uh, crisis management, um, when it's needed for in cases of PTSD or if there's trauma, I do recommend uh, or rec recommend uh, my clients to see an allopathic med uh, to get an allopathic uh, prescription for sleeping tablets. Uh, and this from a place, and I'm emphasizing again, from a crisis situation or, or, or a trauma-related incident. Um, and as Irene mentioned, for a few days, as you see, it becomes an addictive pattern that can occur. A year later, you're sitting with it, and a year later, you're sitting with an addictive pattern that's there. And, 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 and when it comes to something like this, uh, as you can see, it's a lot to do with our cases of um, uh, psychological. So if you're on sleeping medication, it's not just sleeping medication. You're going to have to do in conjunction and complement your therapy uh, with psychological treatment, whether it's coaching or whether it's going to a psychologist or whether it's counseling, but it has to be in a process together so that there's processing that's getting done. Um, so that's, that's, and I won't, re I personally don't recommend it on its own. Uh, it has to be in conjunction with the psychological um, uh, assistance. Uh, because it is very much linked to your mind and your emotions that's not being processed. So, as an Ayurveda wellness practitioner, if somebody had to come to you with sleep issues and you know their dosha, then how would you treat that? Uh, see, I mean, yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just break it down. So you have pathological. So what we're speaking about pathological in the sense that it's, 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 it's chronic issues. So when it's chronic this way, it becomes, as uh, Kevin has said, it becomes that you become a detective in it and you've got to go in deeper. So then that's, uh, you can see as a long, you know, it's a long process. It's not, there's no quick fix for this. Um, but if you're having a, fun, where you have functional, where you're fully functional and it's something now you are seeing as it's, it's creeping into your, day-to-day uh, -day activities uh, so that, that that's what that, that's the perspective that I'm, I'm, I'm going to recommend from a, a preparing for restful sleep from an Ayurvedic perspective we, we, we look I mean not just an Ayurvedic perspective um, as I, Irene also mentioned uh, it's eight to six hours of sleep and now as Kevin mentioned we're living in a highly stimulative world so getting eight to a six to eight hours sleep is is, is a challenge. And as uh, Ari mentioned as well, we are going a constant few times in the night between our alpha, beta, theta, 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 theta waves. So it's like a constant. Um, and when we have to go back to this, to Miney's story, I love that she said, as you plan your day, we need to plan our sleep. And I think it's that we take in because it's a continuous cycle. I mean, we, you think uh, you need to plan your sleep and you just go to sleep. Uh, no, it doesn't happen. Um, and I wanna just tap into our five senses. So here again, if you are having short doses of, uh, or short periods of insomnia, I would say tap into your five senses and that's into your sight, your taste, your touch, your smell and your sound. And I, uh, Irene also tapped into the, and I'm going to go through the different um, recommendations that I have. So I may be repeating what Irene said as well. But if we have to just take it a step back, look at these five different senses that I have and how to come into balance in this to, have, to prepare for your evening's rest. 
So in the evening, um, yeah, again, it's about eating a light dinner. Uh, this could be no later than 7 p.m. So that, I mean, we know our digestion takes a while. So you don't want to be having a dinner and going straight to bed because we know there's side effects with that. Um, taking a leisurely stroll after dinner. Uh, to, to the exact possible minimizing, aggravating, or mentally intensive activities after 8.30. And here again, um, we live in a world where there's so much of stimulation that we, if we don't actually create and be disciplined with our routine, it's, it's a continuous cycle and, it's, and, we did, and our life is deteriorating in that cycle. So it's, it comes back to the discipline that we form with our own routine. Um, and during bedtime, so we need to aim again for 9.30 to 10.30 p.m. to try to get to bed. And here again, if we are not getting, and if we're not used to getting to bed this early, um, maybe for a week or so, try getting to bed by 10.30. And it's, it's a weaning process, like we wean a baby uh, into sleep patterns, the same process. For example, if you usually watch television until midnight, try shutting it off by 11.30 for, for a week and then aim for 11 p.m. the week later. So it's a gradual, you know, uh, our body and our mind resist radical change immediately. So it's that weaning of process there. Um, uh, and then an hour before bedtime, here again, running a hot bath, um, which you can place a few drops of calming aromatherapy, essential oils, such as lavender, sandalwood, or vanilla. You can also diffuse the scent in your bedroom. Um, basically scented products, candles, rupas, incense, for balancing the vata or the pitta that's designed to calm and soothe um, are recommended. And as your bath is running, perform a slow administered oil massage. In Ayurvedic terms, we call this abhyanga. So it's, it's basically warm oils that you can probably just pop into, um, into a little uh, can and into some warm water. So it's slightly warm. Um, and the oils that you could use is uh, sesame or almond oil. And the self-massage, if you would like, you can here again add in um, aromatherapy oils um, like sandalwood or vanilla or lavender, for example, that basically calms the mind. And then after your massage, soak in the tub for 10 to 15 minutes. I don't recommend long soaks, specifically in, 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 in insomnia cases, because it also can if you have high blood pressure, for example, your high blood pressure goes, it increases. So then it's actually counterproductive. So you need to look at your own case scenario here. But it, I mean, for example, I, when I take a long soak, I do find myself getting a little bit more aggravated because I am a pitta, for example. So long soaks aggravates my pitta. Um, so recommended about 10 to 15 minutes of soaking. And while soaking, have the lights low or burning a candle, listening to calming or soothing music. And as I mentioned earlier, it's about tapping into those five senses. Um, so if you have that, so that's your like key or your idea or your area to work with. What, what does my five senses need to downward regulate? So that's, and after your bath, from a taste perspective, to drink something warm. And Irene, I loved your uh, recommendations of cocoa and all of those um, necessary things that our body is craving for because it wants that nurturing. Um, and from an Ayurvedic perspective, we recommend um, warm milk uh, with nutmeg or and honey or something. Tea, valerian root um, as well, or brummy. So it's about downward regulating uh, the nervous system. And if you desire a small cookie, and, uh, and, I, and I like that, that we have to have, and we have to be nice to ourselves. It's, it's the sweet, or we do need that sweetness as a nourishment. I know there's lots of diets that recommend no sugar and all of that. Um, but at the stage when you're having insomnia, your body does require that nurturing. Um, and if your mind is extremely active, um, journal for a few minutes before bed. 
download your thoughts or concerns um, that you don't have to keep ruminating about while you're sleeping. So for me, it's like actually decompressing. For me, it's like taking it, popping it in there, and I'm going to actually pick it up tomorrow. Um, and, and in that way, when I make that little time, I, I, whereas 10 years ago, I used to have a sleep and I'll wake up and I'll be wanting to make a list. And I'm now very dedicated to that. If I do know my mind is overworked and there's a lot of things happening, I try and get that out of the way before I start my evening routine. Um, yeah, again, do not watch TV uh, or work in bed. That's your space. That's your sanctuary. So treat it, respect it in that sense. And it's an environmental space for you. Uh, so respect it in that sense that you're not t taking stimulation into bed. And once you're in bed, um, I know there's a yoga nidra. So if anybody's experienced yoga nidra before or at the end of a yoga class, you're basically lying in savasana where you're actually tuning in to your body from toes. And so you're talking to yourself. And this way, it's a mindful way and it's a self-awareness tool or an exercise to physically contact your body. And so often we don't, I mean, there'll be bloating in your tummy for days and you don't know when it actually had started. So if you get into a, into a rhythm of actually doing this before you go to bed, you can actually start to sense things before it's actually going to occur if you in self tune with your body. Um, and that takes regular practice. Um, and, and, it's, and it's not a long process. It's literally connecting your mind to what's actually happening in your body. And it's a, sensory, it's a sensory experience within yourself. And um, yeah, again, I recommend the slow easing breathing. Uh, Irene mentioned BBB. In, in Ayurvedic terms, we call it bellows breath breathing. Uh, it's, it's also that expelling and, and expanding and working with your breath. And if con the contingency plan, if all of this is not working and if there's a lot going on, uh, and if you're still trying to fall asleep, um, try putting something warm on your belly in the area of your solar plexus. So your solar plexus is in the area just below your, your heart's area and above here. So it's around this area. Here's your solar plexus. Uh, try putting something warm in that area like a heated pad or a heated water bottle. And along with the other areas, uh, other uh, elements that I mentioned to calm your mind. And um, a mantra that, uh, that's recommended, and mantra, mantra is sound therapy. So it's connecting uh, to yourself and to the sound, is a, a sleep mantra that's used is Omagasti Shahina. And I can share that later on as well. Uh, try repeating this because as uh, we mentioned, there's alpha, beta, theta waves. So if our mind is actually going into, um, from, from that uh, active mind, so whilst you're using and you're using your breath and you're saying these sounds, it's dropping you into your, your brain activity with using that primordial sound um, to a less active state. And um, if it's still not working, try sleeping on your stomach, for example, or, or with your feet hanging over the edge of the bed. On a cold night, obviously, wear socks. Um, and this is that that's when, when this, where your body is way too heated, um, you also battle to fall off to sleep. So I know in winter, for example, we can be using a heated blanket, but our body is also heated. So it's, 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 it's as uh, Kevin mentioned, it's not one glove fits all. So it's all, um, you know, you got to, you got to know yourself in that sense. Um, and if you wake up in the night and if you are still bad battling to fall off to sleep, try reclining in a soft, comfortable chair with a blanket. Um, that also will help you and you may fall off to sleep uncomfortably, but at least you're having, I mean, you're obviously going to take care of your, your neck. Uh, try that. I mean, it, it will downward regulate you and you can go into bed afterwards. Um, if all, fa all else fails, continue dis with, with this disruptive sleep. Try staying up all night. I know it sounds a bit radical, but this comes back to resetting that circadian clock without obviously taking the medication. So try not falling off to sleep. I mean, this is now after three nights or four nights, and it's like constant you not falling asleep. It obviously is going to be impacting your day activity. Uh, so try and 
try staying up all night and avoid napping during the the next the next day. And and that that ne the next day by nine p.m. Um, your body and mind will be ready to sleep. So it's like a, a force injection uh, to reset yourself. And uh, this often resets your biological clock. Um, this, this again, if there's a pathological or if there's chronic or if there's PTSD or if there's a lot of uh, psychological disturbances that happen, that's happening, that is to be seen differently and, and to be treated in a different environment. Um, so it's helpful to remember that if you're lying still in bed, silently repeating a sleeping mantra or breathing and where you, you are feeling calm, that's okay. You don't have to fall completely into deep sleep. Your met 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 metabolic rate or activity is nearly as low as if you were in a deep sleep. So you are getting some restorative healing or sleep uh, from, from that state. So even if your mind is still somewhat active, your body is getting the deep rest it needs. So therefore, don't, don't really worry about that. Only worry about it when it's like excessive of going into weeks of it and then start reaching out for extended uh, assistance. And um, yeah, so that's, that pretty much sums up. And I was trying to cut it down and I didn't want to duplicate too much of what Irene had said because we obviously share the same thought patterns in terms of trying a natural route as, first, uh, as, as your first alternative um, before going into um, allopathic medication. But I think it's been really valuable to see, you know, from the Ayurvedic perspective, um, and as you said, you doubling up a lot with what Irene had said as well, and, and Kevin mentioned some of those things too. So it's just been echoed a, a, again and again and again from slightly different angles, um, but yet um, coming from the same place, which I think is, is key to, to see that pattern of repetition. And thank you for the offer of the, the mantra. I think we can add that onto the seven day longevity challenge as well. And, I'll also uh, prepare, sorry, sorry about that. I'll also prepare what I've just said and um, like Irene and he, I mean, if, if anybody who does want that, it can be circulated. Thank you. And then we've got a, a challenge from Kevin as well. So um, all of the, the speakers here today are um, sharing their values even further. So please do, do join that valuable um, challenge where you'll be guided through step by step, day by day to get your day routine and that will affect your night routine um, back into to health and wellness. In my practice um, of kinesiology, I have just found time and time again that um, those struggling with sleep really benefit, and this is over time, it works with an accumulation effect, but benefit from the gentle but powerful Bach flower remedies. So one particular remedy, um, for example, for an overactive mind, something um, which I've recently um, given to Mani, she just started a, a week ago. So let's see how this works for her, is white chestnut. So that just turns down the thoughts. It doesn't switch it off completely, but especially when you are having an intention to work through something from a natural perspective, the Bach flowers are just the perfect support for that. There are 38 different uh, mother tinctures. So we create a very personalized mix when you have a Bach flower consultation. And this is going to be one of the prizes that we are giving away. Um, so here comes the question. And you can either email me the answer Helen at helenhanson.co or you can just pop it into the box below. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can pop your answers in there and then we will um, announce the winners once the webinar is finished airing after the 23rd of October. Okay, the question is, please name the three different dosha types and then you will have a chance to win a Bach flower remedy uh, personalized for you. Uh, we also have, of course, Dr. Arendt's wellness course, the online 12 week, which you can do at any time. Um, you can do it over 12 months, as she was saying earlier. And um, we have the Odyssey subscriptions, 
We have colloidal silver giveaways as well. So there's lots of yummy, good uh, wellness prizes, giveaways for you. And, and for your whole family, really, because it, it, all of these extend across the board. So we look forward to, to receiving your, your answers and, and also your comments and feedback. Um, you know, this, these TLC webinars are a work in progress and they're done for you um, to assist you with optimal real health solutions. So if you've got any suggestions or even suggestions for future topics, please do share that um, in the box below or pop me an email so that we can keep on track with your needs. So I think I'd like to end uh, with a message of hope uh, from Mani. We're turning to Mani Javier again. Um, in the phone conversation I had with her recently, she mentioned something that really um, touched me and I'd like to share that with you now in closing. My best advice for people who suffer from insomnia and who haven't really found a way to deal with it is that when you wake up in the middle of the night, be nice to yourself, be kind. Something woke you up, whether it's a um, chemical or a noise or uh, a panic attack or whatever it is, be kind. Do not get yourself into a frost because it's counterproductive. And to make peace with the fact that sometimes you wake up in the night and you can't go back to sleep straight away. <clears throat> I think it's part, it's part of self-care is that you don't have to love your insomnia, but you have to treat it like somebody else's child. Be kind, be nice, and look after it. And on that positive note, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Arvin. Thank you, Soloshni. And thank you, Anne, as well. This would not have been possible without all of you. And of course, thank you so much for you who have been watching this or listening to this wherever you are. Uh, this is the reason why we're doing this. So thank you for your support. And please do share our future uh, webinars with your friends and family. Take care and be well.